if there is a need or a hunger for the true word of God. And we can get up and we can shout and we can dance and we can be inspired by so many different words and so many different uh, methods of encouragement. But it's almost like what Paul was saying that when he was talking to the uh, church at Corinth, he said, I come to you not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the power and of the spirit. What he was saying, was there was great orators at that time. There were some great speakers who you would walk in front of or sit underneath, and you would be very, very inspired. They could really, really charge your spirit, somewhat like today. You know, not necessarily charge your spirit, but charge your emotions. And so getting back to the basics is the foundational principles of what the word of God is and how it can be applied to our life and breaking that down. Getting back to teaching. I look at the word of God and, and, I, 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 and I'm looking at the words of Jesus and they are the very words of Jesus. They're the very words of God. Nowhere in there that I hear see Jesus when he was teaching say, mm -hmm, ha, and all of this other stuff. Now, there's nothing wrong with that because that's a style. But when that style becomes a bit of a performance and it becomes a bit of a rhetoric, and then when the young children can be at five and six years old thinking that they're mimicking a preacher because they all sound the same, it's mimicry, then I got a problem. Because if all of I heard from you is mm, ha, and hanging and danced and shouted and at the end of the service I became no better in my knowledge of God and who he is and how I can apply it to my life, then what was the real purpose for me coming to the body? Of, what was the real purpose of me coming to church? The true purpose of us coming to church, just like with Jesus, is to receive the word. He kept the disciples with him for three and a half years. And he taught them. He so taught them that, that by the end of that, he was able to go on to, 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 to glory, send the Holy Spirit as their helper, and they were then able to go out and to teach. If you have been under a ministry over three and four years and you're not able to go out and do the same thing that the man of God, maybe not in the same calling, per se, because everybody's not called to teach, everybody's not called to preach, but if you're not comfortable or empowered to go out and share the gospel, something's wrong. And that's what we're doing here with Hope for Today Ministries. We're teaching the word of God so that you would not just come here week after week after week after week and sit underneath a teaching and never be empowered or receive the knowledge or the ability to go out and to share the gospel and the word of God and to know it. And so we're going to be talking about the God kind of faith. And we're going to be starting in Hebrews, a very famous uh, scripture, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith. Faith. Faith is the very foundation. Without faith, we can't get to God. Without faith, we can't apply anything else to our lives. We cannot even uh, begin our journey without faith. Because the Bible says in order to be saved, we must believe and confess. We must confess the Lord Jesus and believe in our hearts. That belief, that belief system is faith. But we're going to dig into what actually faith is and what it is not and how the church uh, or not the church, uh, uh, so to speak, the true church. We understand what, what faith really is, but how sometimes people can get it twisted, so to speak. And so we're looking at the Greek word for faith. Uh, the Greek word for faith is pistis. Faithful, faithfulness, belief, trust, with an, an implication that actions based on that trust may follow. The faith often refers to the Christian system of belief and lifestyle, assurance, belief, believe it, believe, fidelity. The key thing in that verse or that key thing in that, 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 that definition is saying that with an implication that actions based on that trust may follow. So in other words, faith is trust. Faith is trust. And so now it just, and we're going to go into this a little bit deeper, that implications that actions based on that trust may follow. 
If you ever sat on a chair, some of you are sitting in chairs right now, you trust that chair, you know, so you wouldn't have sat in it. You have a belief system that has been built up over time that the very seat that you're sitting on is able to hold you. So you put that into action. You just didn't say, I believe the chair can hold me. You sat down in a chair as an action that indicates your faith in the chair. The Hebrew word for faith is amen, a root word that denotes reliability. Stability, firmness. Evan concretely meant to support or uphold as an example for strong arms, for the strong arms of a parent would uphold an infant. You ever seen a baby being held up by its mother? That's what this, the Hebrew word denotes reliability. I can rely on you. If you pick a baby up because the baby is young enough and naive enough and trusting enough to allow you to pick them up nine times out of ten, especially if it's in the arms of their, their father or their mother, they're not going to be screaming and kicking because they believe that their father or their mother is going to drop them. No, they believe and they trust that there's, there, there's, there's that reliability. Even at a two-year-old or a three-year-old, what are they doing? They're doing like this because they believe that, number one, you have the, the ability to pick them up. Number two, you're reliable because over and over and over again, you've picked them up and you've never dropped them. So there's no terror in that. And how much more God? God is giving us an illustration of how our faith is to operate. We are to be believing that God is reliable. We are to be trusting of God to the point to where we put our trust into actions and to put, now our faith is putting the chair at work. Our faith is putting the chair to work because we're saying, I believe that you're going to hold me now, I'm going to sit down. Now the, now the chair is working. Just like with God. Another word used to convey an idea of faith is yari. Usually translated to fear, reverence, stand in awe. So, if we believe God, or we have faith, we must understand what does that mean when we when we say faith. Faith. We hear people say, "Well, I have faith. I believe in God." So many different people that we talk to on a day-to-day -day basis, depending upon how you ask the question, or what or, or what situation or scenario you pose, they will tell you that they have faith. Well, here's an aspect of faith that we all need to have. It says, "What do you expect?" Faith is expecting something. In Hebrews eleven and six, we see. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Ah. Uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. But we know that faith is not just lip service. Faith is trust. And trust is put into action. So God is not saying, without you saying you believe in me, it is impossible to please me. He is saying, without there being some resemblance that you trust me, it is impossible to please me. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now that, I, I'll say that's the easy part. Because saying that we believe that he is is just really saying that we believe that he is. We're going to go into that later. But it's saying, must first believe that he is, but here, catch this, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So if you're diligently seeking the Lord, he's saying that you should be expecting a reward. Now, the, expected, the expectation of an award, or reward rather, has to have some type of corresponding action to go with it. What does that sound like? Why just saying that you have faith in God is just words? Because if I say a particular thing about God, if I say, well, I'm no longer this, or I'm no longer that, 
or I, I, I'm a child of God. And people say this thing, I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. Uh, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. But then in timidity and, 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 and shakiness, you see that they really don't believe what they say they believe. So in other words, they were just doing like this person here is saying. Blah, 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 blah. The devil is not afraid of you saying what you say. He's more afraid of you putting in action. Because I can sit in this chair all day long. And I, you know what? I really believe that this chair, and him and the devil, like, mm -hmm, but you ain't going to sit in it. And I really believe that I, you know, I, I'm an overcomer. And, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm bold in the Lord. And I can do what the Bible says I can do. And I can do all of these things. But the devil is not impressed until you sit down in that chair. You can say all you want to say about how the chair is great, it's going to hold me up and this, that, and other. But until you put that faith, your words into action, God is saying, he that believeth must believe that I'm a rewarder. So you, you first believe that, the, you believe that it can, but then to put the actions into place is another thing. And so in James, Chapter 2, verses 19 through 26. It's okay. Since it can only hold 30, 30 minutes of footage. Do you believe that there is one God you do well? Even the devil, devil believes, or the demons believe, and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that, that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which said Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Amen. Here's James. We're talking about faith. And James says here a very powerful portion of this scripture. It says, thou believest that there is one God. It's basically like attaboy. Pat on the back. You, you, you're doing well. He says, the demons or the devils also believe and tremble. But will thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? He says, you believe that there is one God. You do well. He said, now you're on the same level as the devil. Because they believe and tremble. So what makes us different than demons or devils? He basically, James is saying, so if you say you believe in God, you're at the same level as the devils or the demons. But without know, O oh man, that faith without works is dead. In other words, there should be some corresponding action to your faith. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Abraham not only said that he believed God, but he believed him to the point to where he was obedient. See, obedience is better than sacrifice. That's what that, that's where that term comes from. You say, uh, you know, I'm doing all of these things. You can clap, dance, praise, do roll over in the aisle, cry, snot, do all of this stuff. But if you're not obedient to the word of God on a day-to-day -day basis, he says your belief is pretty much in vain because you're not you're not exhibiting what you believe on a day-to-day -day basis. And so seest how, seest thou how faith wrought his works, and his and by works 
was made perfect. And the scriptures were fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Now let's break that down because we've heard that by faith no man, by works no man should be justified. What he's, not, what he's saying is not about salvation. He's saying that by works your faith is validated. In other words, there is an outside of you just saying you believe, you, there, there's nothing else that would indicate that you are a believer until corresponding actions, a lifestyle is attributed to your belief. Likewise, it even talks about Rahab, the harlot, was just, the harlot justified by works when she received the messengers and had them sent out another way. She basically helped the spies. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I don't want no dead faith. I don't know about y'all. And so we're going to look at a familiar scripture in a passage where Jesus utilizes this faith. And in Mark 11, verses 12 through 14, we see Jesus in operation. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar off a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And the disciples heard it. Amen. Here's Jesus teaching again. Jesus is always teaching. We need teachers because without teachers, we can't grow. We can't, we, we, we can't, we can't understand these things. And with understanding comes revelation, you know, from the word of God. And so what God is revealing in this scripture is very powerful. He says, and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry, and he seen a fig tree afar off having leaves. He came, up. he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. But the time of figs was not yet. Jesus found this fig tree. This is a whole other lesson for a whole other day, but for the, for the sake of this particular teaching, I'm just going to skirt on the, on the surface of this. But he, he found this fig tree that was bearing no fruit. The fig tree was supposed to be bearing fruit. It was supposed to be doing what it was supposed to be doing. Jesus was hungry. He was looking for it. There was nothing on there. And Jesus said, on, and Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of the hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. We're going to pause right there because the Bible says in Proverbs 18 21 this is a very powerful principle death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So here Jesus is actually speaking death, but death in a positive way. How can death be spoken in a positive way? Well, there are people who are right now dealing with certain ailments and diseases. They're dealing with cancers in their body. They're dealing with things, wrong relationships. Maybe it's a, re maybe it's a relationship that they're, 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 their loved one is in or their children are in. You have the ability and the power to speak death. And when I say death, you can say death to the cancer that is trying to grow in your body, that it would shrivel up and die. Death to whatever it is that is wrong or that is going on in your life. Death meaning death to whatever it is that is trying to materialize itself in your life and cause you more harm. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so in that 
There's even assignments. There's, there's, you got people who are witches and warlocks. You can say, I speak death to the assignments. I speak death to anything that they're trying to pronounce over me. In the name of Jesus. Jesus is showing us a principle here with this fig tree in that he cursed it that it would not grow anymore. Nobody's going to eat from this. Is what Jesus said. And so we're going to fast forward. It says when you speak God's word in faith, it will work. We're going to fast forward in this story and see what happened in verses 20 through 26. Now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rahab, I mean Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said unto them, Have faith in God. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you will receive them and you will have them. And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. Amen. We see here in verse 20, and in the morning they pass by they saw the fig tree dried up from its roots. Dried up from its roots. That's what I was talking about. Whatever it is, you can cause something to be dried up. If there's a wrong relationship with a loved one that you just want to dry up, if you see them in harm's way and you and you just you, you, they won't listen to you, but you can pray that the Holy Spirit would go and dry that thing up. You're praying for a loved one that may, be, that may be diagnosed with cancer. You pray that that cancer be dried up. Whatever it is, we have the power, we have the ability through our faith to speak to it and to expect it to dry up. Maybe it's something that is a, 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 a vice or something that has been gripping us, a, a Something that is causing us to easily stumble. We can pray, Holy Spirit, cause that thing, that, that perversion to dry up in the name of Jesus. And Peter calling to remember and saith unto him, Master, behold the victory which thou curses is withered away. Jesus said unto him, have faith in God. Now another translation, if you look at the Greek, is actually Jesus is saying, not just have faith in God, he's saying have the faith of God. And so when we say have the faith of God, God is our Father. God spoke the worlds into existence. He said, let there be light, and there was light. Darkness didn't intimidate him when he saw that there was nothing. That's why it says that we are to call those things which be not as though they were. That's something powerful. Call those things which be. It's another thing to see something and to talk to it. It's another thing to where there is nothing there and to speak to it as though it is there. Finances. I, I, don't, I don't have what I need, but I, I call it into existence because I know that I'm like my father and my father says have the faith of God. Have the faith of God meaning have faith like God. We are his children. It is Jesus says, for verily, verily I say unto you that whosoever that's a whosoever. Shall say unto this mountain, Jesus has to make it plain because he has to draw the contrast in which our faith is to be operating in. He says, who shall say unto this mountain? He didn't say table, chair, the little hill over there. No, mountain. Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart. We're going to get back to that. Doubt in his heart. But shall believe that those things which he says shall come to pass, and he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive, and ye shall have them. 
You might have it. You could possibly have it. You got a 50 50 chance. You got an 80 20 percent chance of getting it. He, he, he do it sometimes, but not all the time. He's, no, he said, You shall have it. And it says a very crucial part here. Everybody usually cuts that part off. But it says, Well, when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against any, that your Father which is in heaven may forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your trespasses. There's another scripture in the Bible where it talks about husbands and wives. Get this thing together so that your prayers be not hindered. Basically he's saying don't allow an ought or unforgiveness to hinder your very prayers. And so what Jesus is saying here is you can say to a mountain, be thou removed. But he says something that's key here, and I think the enemy plays, plays a very, very, very dirty trick on people when they see this because there's nobody teaching this. And so he says, Jesus says, and shall not doubt in his heart. What does doubting in your heart mean? Doubting your heart, doubting your head is not doubting your heart. What are you saying? That's Jacob. Well, we're going to go to James. And we'll look at this. What does doubting your heart mean? James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it is full grown, brings forth death. Ah, James has given us a real deal teaching on seed, time, and harvest. And this is what goes on perpetually every day of our lives. Every day that we wake up, I can guarantee that at least one or two times, four, five, six, seven times or more, that this is going to happen to you. It says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Didn't say that temptation didn't come on. He says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. So how do you endure temptation? When he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the, blessed is the man that if, when he's tempted, he don't fall into it. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. Anytime that you're tempted, it is most certainly, undeniably, unmistakably the devil. The devil is coming to you at your weaknesses. And we talked about this weeks ago, even in the book, My Able Twin, Understanding the War Between Flesh and the Spirit. He's not coming to you in areas in which you already have the victory over. He's coming to you in areas in which you struggle. That's why it says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us. See, there's some stuff that beset you that might not beset me. There may be some stuff that beset me that not may beset you. In other words, cause you to trip up 2019. And so the enemy is coming to you. If you don't have a problem with smoking weed, he ain't going to send no new weed man at you. He ain't going to send nobody smoking around you. He's going to send whatever it is that you like. And if you like looking at the pretty girls, if you like pornography, if you like uh, all of those different things, that's the areas in which where the enemy is going to come at you at. And so when he says, let no one say that he, when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted, and neither he tempt any man. We know where the source is. It's the enemy. But the enemy is coming to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So we know that death is the ultimate, the ultimate uh, 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 scheme, so to speak, of the enemy. But when he, every man, but every man is tempted. He said, "Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust." 
We have to look in the mirror and say that when I fall, it's because I failed. It's because I chose to. His own lust and entice it. And then when lust have conceived and bring it forth sin, and sin when it disfigures, bring it forth death. So here's this, here's this process. Here comes the thought. But the thought itself is not sin, because if the thought were sin, then we'd all be in trouble. We wouldn't have a choice. The Bible wouldn't say casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. God says that I give you the ability to when the thought comes, just like that exit sign says, there have no temptation has taken you, but which is common to man, that God has made a way of escape. When that image or that thing comes before you, or when whatever it is comes before you that you are wanting to get away from, God says, I've made a way for you to escape. Now, you can choose the exit sign, or you can go back in and join the party. A lot of times, we are in that split situation, that split moment of decision. And this is where Jesus was talking about, and shall not doubt in his heart, particular thing.